This is my story with nicotine and how I eventually quit. We're going to start off 16 years old in the high school locker room right after gym class. And I was never the most popular kid in school. who was a little too smart and tried a little too hard to really fit in. But we would sit in the locker room right after gym class, five minutes before we had to leave, and the kids would put out their jewels. And I was like, okay, can I, can I hit one of those? And they looked at me, they're like, Jason, you vape? I'm like, I haven't, but like, I want to try. And they're like, your JY is going to hit this. So they give it to me and I hit it. And I'm like, in my, my head just goes like spinning. And I'm like trying to keep my balance against the wall. And they're kind of like chuckling. Cause they're like, Oh, it's his first time. Like you, if you vape, you know, but I'm just kind of what my brother and I would call getting star effed. Cause I want to on YouTube, but it's like, the feeling of getting shot through the universe and what I would relate to the French meaning petite mort for an orgasm, which is little death and way of the superior man talks about how the masculine essence kind of craves that feeling of freedom. And when the nicotine kind of takes over and it just like, shoots you through this expanse and you're like you just feel like the whole world is evaporated and you don't have a worry and it's just like whoa that was my first time i ever vaped and i continue to hit it in the locker room after gym class this is my junior year of high school and then that winter i Turned to my brother, I'm like, hey man, like, you're 18, can you, uh, can you get me a Novo? And he's like, sure. So he got me a Novo and I fill it with 50 Nick juice. And for the first three months, I would hit it and I go, <sighs> and I just let out the thing. And it was like, getting teleported and all my like all the stress I was under kind of went away and all the anxiety and this feeling of like a slight ego death because the nicotine when you're doing that high concentrations with no tolerance takes control of you but that's what it does it takes control and three months down the line, I wasn't getting the same head rush I got. And I was like, okay, let me try cutting back on this and seeing if that can help me. So I would put it upstairs in my desk and I would try to stay away from it, but I would wind up running upstairs and hitting it. I would be constantly thinking about it. And when I got home from school, I'm like, I I need to go hit it. Like it was this constant thought in my head of nicotine, nicotine, nicotine. And I would always eventually cave in to the feeling of it. And this progressed all through junior year like junior year, senior year, I just complete Nick I would hit it. I would uh, I'd make a bong where I had a dab pen and a little uh, Novo and I made an adapter so you could put them both in the bong and you could take massive hits off of that. But I was just in this period between like still being able to feel it but not yet understanding the grasp that it had on me and how it was affecting me and it took me a long time to fully understand the psychology behind it 
but I would I didn't really want to because I was scared of admitting how much control it had and I would be able to think of nothing else but it when I was away from it I had to constantly have it on me if I went out traveling got off the airplane first thing I did was run to the bathroom <laughs> And that hit, for the people who vape, that hit was one of the best you've ever experienced. Because you're creating it, you're imagining what it's going to feel like for the past six hours stuck on that plane. And you're just imagining that warmth, the watermelon at the time was my flavor. But, oh my god, it was like, I love this. And then, I started getting into energy drinks. And the feeling of being cracked out, like my brother and I call it chasing the mad pony or uh, because there's an engine called mad pony or uh, the dragon. But it's like the feeling you get when you just consume, you wake up in the morning, you chug down a bang, you hit the nicotine right as the bang's peaking and you just feel freaking invincible. You're like... Give me whatever the pro like throw anything my way and I can overcome it. Like you feel so strong, but you crash so hard off of it. And that's what I did. Eventually senior year leads to me getting accepted into college. So I'm going to college now. And that's more stressful than I thought it was gonna be. So I'd be in the library hitting it. But at this point in time, I have it down to a system of one hit every two hours. And that way I could maintain my tolerance and I would get a head rush at each one. And not even necessarily the head rush, but it's like wearing a pair of uncomfortable shoes so that when you eventually take them off, the relief you feel is so euphoric that you're like, oh, it's like a beeping sound that won't go off. And eventually it does and you feel relief, but the relief's only there in comparison to the pain you were in before. And I didn't realize that at the time I thought I found a cheat code. I thought I can hit this once every two hours and I'll get the head rush. I'd have it on the nightstand right next to my bed. And I'd wake up in the morning. And what I'd do is I'd just, I'd rip that. And I'd just hold it in, zero it out. And it's like a feeling of melting into your bed and just being thrown backwards. Like, and I would chase this. I would do whatever I could to find that feeling. And... Later that year, we wind up at a frat party. And there's a guy there, I'm talking to him, and I'm like, I'm such a Nick fiend, man. He's like, I'm an even bigger Nick fiend. I'm like, nah, that's not possible. Like, I bet I'm bigger. Like, I like, bet I like him more than you. And we get into this argument, and he's like, I have this huge bong upstairs. Let's do a rip of tobacco. And I'm never liked cigarettes. Always disgusted by them. Even when I smoked. I was disgusted by cigarettes and I'd brush my teeth afterwards. But when you're chasing the high, it becomes acceptable. Like you don't realize when you first start, like how stuff can build up. It's like a person with a dirty, with a disgusting house. Like they don't actually know how disgusting their house is. They just never vacuumed it, and it's eventually over time gotten that way. They just accept it. It's kind of the same way. So we go upstairs, and I'm sitting on the bed, and I pack the bowl full gram of tobacco, like a full cigarette's worth of tobacco at least, and it's a three-foot bong. I do the whole bowl, and I hold it, and I'm holding it, and I fall backwards. 
and this is even more powerful than the first time I ever smoked. Like, this is the, more powerful than it was in the locker room. I go beyond. And you're asking beyond where? Like, I had an ego death of my own and experienced the bliss within. And from then on, I was hooked. Like, I, I didn't didn't really care that much for vaping. I did bong hits of tobacco. And I'd make my own bongs out of water bottles. And I'd get a water bottle and I would take, i cut a hole in it, I'd take a carrot, and I'd use a drill bit, and I'd make a down, I'd make a stem for it, I'd use a knife to carve a bowl, and I'd put the carrot in there, and then I'd put tape along the edges to make a seal. And then I'd put ice in there. And that way I could pack the carrot with tobacco, hit that, and I didn't buy a bong myself. Um, it was kind of like, it's not an issue unless I spend money on it. So, by making the bong, which I don't have to do once a week, it was like being able to maintain control and not admitting that's an issue because for some reason... If I spent money on it, then that then only then would it be an issue. Not because I was bumming the tobacco off my brother, but we'd get to this point where I'd wake up in the morning with this splitting headache, like unable to think. Like my lungs would physically be craving it. And I would run downstairs, and this is during COVID, so like my whole family was home. But I'd run downstairs. I'd go to my back porch. And I'd grab my bong, and I'd grab the tobacco, and I'd be packing it. And it's freezing cold outside some of those times. And I'd be out there in my underwear, and I'd just be... And I would hold that, I'd hold that in for the life of me, because I knew that's the best rip I'd get all day. I'm not going to... If I can't hold this whole thing in, none of my other hits this day is going to be as good as this one. Like, this is the best one. My tolerance is the lowest. This is the most pain that I'm in. So the relief of pressure is going to be the highest. And I got to that point, and I was like, I hit it. And afterwards, I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak. I would stumble around for like a minute. And then the world would like come back into focus. And I was just like, and that's how I lived. Like the highs were so freaking high and the lows were so low. But at this time I was also developing my caffeine addiction and I would be chugging. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have a bang in a giant Yeti tumbler beside my bed and I'd chug that. And then after I chugged that, I'd go downstairs. I would be chugging that while I hit the first tobacco. And then two hours later, as I was starting on my next bang. The caffeine would be peaking. My Adderall would be peaking because I have ADHD, which at the time I wasn't taking enough of my medication. And there's some other factors in play along stress. But needless to say, my ADHD has played itself out in a very addictive personality. So being aware of that has helped a lot because it's been able to I have the awareness to never allow myself in the same room as cocaine because I think I would like it too much from the descriptions other people have given me. And I will not allow myself to touch it. So anyways, back to the story. I be peaking on caffeine and I'd be hitting the tobacco every two hours and then I'd come upstairs and I'd just cram. I'd cram an insane amount because my identity which i've talked about in another video is straight a student it's straight a jason from high school i have to maintain that same identity so the energy drinks the tobacco all of this stuff i thought was helping me but it was actually just trading my health for grades which don't matter like your grades do not matter people tell you they do and not filling your classes is beneficial but it's your understanding it's not the grades and I couldn't separate that from myself because 
I was Jason. I was straight A's. That was who I was. And for any parents out there, do not put that pressure on your kid. Like, it is a horrible place to be because you will sacrifice health. You will sacrifice friends. You will sacrifice other opportunities so that you can maintain the identity of yourself as being a straight A student. Because without that, you don't necessarily know who you are because that is don't ask you, who are you? It's like, I am Jason. I'm a student. I'm a straight A student. And that's kind of how the identity goes. And people will do whatever it takes to keep the identity. Like, look at how many vegans there are that have been doing it for years and they maintain the diet and it's killing them. But they identify with the community of vegans for so long that they don't realize that animal meats aren't bad. Like, death and life is a cycle of life. Like, death, living, eating like other animals, it's a cycle of life. Like, a cat's not bad because it kills a mouse and eats it. It's a cat. We're not bad because we kill fish, we kill cows, eat them. That's the cycle of life. You should get your food from the highest ethical source you can. Make sure it's well raised. Make sure it's not farmed. Make sure it's well taken care of and you lived an ethical, nice life because that's decent. But you are meant to eat meat. And anyone who tells you different, I would pray for because they're going to experience some very negative health benefits coming their like def- detriments coming their way in the next couple of years. But it was great where I was back to the story of the addiction, the ripping tobacco turned to cigarettes because I went to Florida for my brother's wedding because he married a girl from down there and I didn't have easy access to my bong. I did make one while down there, but I started smoking. And it was much more of a leveled out high than what I was used to with the tobacco and I, with the bong rips. And at the point in time in my life, I was craving that. I'm like, I don't want to be here. Because the higher you go, the lower you're falling. Like, you want to level out and understand that it's a slow rise up. That if you can make it, if you can improve yourself 1% every day. Because when you get the giant peaks, which I've lived in my life, it's horrible. The highs you feel do not make up for the lows. The lows you lose yourself in and it can be very difficult to come out of but I was craving more normalcy so I started smoking and I found that to relieve my stress because surprise going outside is beneficial but when I go outside what do you do when you smoke you go outside you focus on your breathing you put your mind back into your body and take it off of your stresses you focus on the high that you're feeling So, that's a breathing exercise. Like, the cigarettes themselves don't really do anything. It's the breathing, the conscious, the focusing on it, being out in nature and removing your mind from the problems that I found actually was beneficial. But at the time, I didn't realize that. I thought it was all the nicotine. And I smoked for another year. And then my brother came over one day and I was like, oh, thank God I'm out of tobacco. I'm going to, I'm going to hit his and I'm going to, uh, I'll roll some cigarettes and everything. And I'm like, hey, hey, Dem, do you have any tobacco? Like, where is it? Like, want to go to the car and smoke? He's like, should I quit? I'm like, what do you mean you quit? He's like, yeah, like, my wife got me this book called The Easy Way by Alan Carr, and I quit. I'm like, what? Like, you're not fucking, like, you're not being a, you're not being cheap. Like, you actually quit? He's like, yeah, I quit. I'm like, whoa. Maybe it's possible. And... I bought the book the next day on Audible, but I didn't listen to it for two weeks. 
because I was a smoker and that was like going back to it, that was part of my identity. It's like I was a smoker and the book, what it does is it breaks down all the reasons you tell yourself why you think you enjoy it. And it's absolutely brilliant. And if I go too into detail and give you guys the wrong impression of the book, you might not actually read it for yourself because you might think you understand it. But if you know someone who smokes, if you smoke yourself, if you even have the occasional cigarette after a meal or find yourself craving one, the easy way by Alan Carr is by that by far the best way. When I eventually finished the book and I quit, I was convinced I'd have headaches. So I took Advil for that week and then I stopped taking it and I was like, where's the pain? Like I've tried quitting in the past. And when you quit in the past, you're be surprised, but the cold feeling you get, the ache in the body, just all the symptoms, it's mental. Like it's going to mess with you, but like you've heard about the placebo effect. This is a similar effect to it where you expect to have this. Therefore you do. I've known kids who didn't think they were addicted to nicotine, stopped doing it, and had almost no symptoms, maybe a tiny, like, they just felt a little off. And looking back, I was asking them what, how much they were doing, and there they're, was like a 10-pack a day, a pack a day habits, and the equivalent for vaping, that is, because not many youths actually smoke, but... They just quit cold turkey, but they never thought they were addicted. They found it easy to do. And that's one of the things I realized is like the actual warning label being put on cigarettes saying warning addictive, that's the best marketing the cigarettes company have. Like them telling you that this is addictive, this is going to kill you, all this stuff, that is what keeps you smoking. Cigarettes are not addictive. They're very easy to quit. Read the book and you'll see how. Cigarettes, they are going to kill you. But the fact that they tell you that, guess what? Makes you stressed out. And where do you turn when you're stressed? To cigarettes. It's a vicious cycle that they keep you in. And reading the book helped me realize that. And eventually, I quit. And for the longest time, I had this thought in my head. Will there ever be a day that I don't? think about nicotine and then from there it turned into this intrusive thought of i'd be driving and then the thought popped in my head is there ever going to be a day i won't think about nicotine and i was like oh i thought about nicotine so the thought itself became a habit for me somehow so i'd have the thought and having the thought itself is thinking about nicotine because before then i was driving and i'd be like i want nicotine i'm like no, you don't. You're happy to be free. And I repeat this to myself three times every time I had an impulse. I'm like, no, you don't. You're happy to be free. No, you don't. Like, just that's what you have to tell yourself be to uncondition the lies you've been told. And eventually, I stopped having those impulses. But I still had the... While I was having the impulses, I was wondering, is there ever going to be a day that I don't have one? Or don't think about nicotine. And then I wouldn't think about nicotine, but I'd think about not thinking about nicotine, which is inherently thinking about nicotine. And eventually they somehow just went away with time. And it's gotten to the point now where I look back on my life and I'm like, oh yeah, I was once heavily addicted to smoking and nicotine. And I tried the gum. I Back in the story, um, I think I skipped over this part. I tried patches. I, uh, my brother has a funny story I'll bring on to tell, but he walked into my room once and I had two patches on my butt and was ripping my Novo, laughing my butt off, being, hey man, you should really get on these patches. They're great. And he thought it was the funniest thing because, like I said, I was a fiend. Like, I, I have this image in the back of my room and I'm not sure 
how good this is going to come across. But I was stuck in math class one day and I couldn't stop thinking about nicotine. It's all the only thing I could think of. I couldn't concentrate on what he's talking about. So I started drawing this image. And what that is, is that's a model of my Novo, the where I used to hit vape, where the lines are the word nicotine written over and over again, like a possessed chant. And that's one of the ways I kind of describe the mindset you're in. And it's so nice to be free. Like, there's been a slip up along the way or two where even in the book, it doesn't address the pleasure I got from extremely large dosages of nicotine in the sense of freedom. It doesn't address it in the book. But one thing I realized is it's not worth the rest of this. It, the place the book kind of takes you to is by disproving all the reasons why you tell yourself you want to use it, it makes it a lot easier to quit. Because I have no desire to do cocaine. And it's very easy for me to never touch it. But my slip-ups were because I still told myself I had the desire for that sense of freedom done through nicotine. And while I found that to somewhat still be the case, even though other people I know who've quit don't have that affinity. So it's not like... I have been able to disprove every single reason why I want to vape, but I've done most of them. And the one that's left is I still have a desire for that sense, but I've been able to satisfy through breath exercises, through meditation, running. It's not quite the same, but the sensation you have after you sprint a mile the hardest you physically can and then you stop you have this like tingling through your mind your head is pulsating with blood like you just relax into that for a second and it's almost there and i actually like it more because it lasts a lot longer afterwards but i'm here to say that it's a a hell of a drug that they normalize with this society and there's there's a way out and it's not by limiting your number of dosages it's not by using patches you can't quit nicotine through using nicotine no matter what form it is zins even though i don't understand why people like them because you don't get the head rush from like you do when you vape like i've tried zins that i yeah, now my mouth is like full of spit. That's that's told the like what I, I don't get them, but no matter what it is that you're actually using, there is a method to quit, and that is reading the easy way. I mean, it's like thirteen dollars. You can get it used off eBay. You can find the PDF online, but reading it and then. I recommend the audiobook, the simple fact of I had that playing in my ears for the first week four times. I put it on times two speed, and that's all I'd be doing is just listening to the book because I had to keep retelling myself this stuff. And in the end, you don't have to use willpower. You are able to quit, and it's very easy. You enjoy it because you don't realize the the sense of the like emotional heaviness you have because you don't have control of your own mind. Like there's this, what the book would call a little monster, but it's like, you know, you're at the whim of this other thing 
and it's not a pleasant place to be. And once I finally quit, I was like, I did it. Like, I, I, I didn't fail. Like, I'd been failing for years. Like, there's a joke of, hey, man, I'm so good at quitting nicotine. I've done it a thousand times. And then you lean back and you hit a giant rip. It's like, I've said that joke. Like, it's, uh, it's true, but it's a horrible place to be. So, yeah, comment down below if you have any thoughts on this. Um, if you have any more questions, I can love to answer those. Easy Way by Alan Carr. Like, yeah, that book's amazing.